Hello, my name is Cam Holson, founder and CEO of Everest, and I'm delighted to introduce you to an amazing group of panelists. Uh, we have people in the team that have started companies to help others pursue becoming entrepreneur by having a secure uh, data in their profile. We have someone who worked for Secret Service for more than 20 years, and now he's chief security officer of one of the biggest security company in U.S. We have a researcher from one of the leading universities in the U.S. that helps company define the complex system, so then they're able to protect it in a more uh, logical and uh, efficient way. And finally, we have someone who comes from the security background and for 20 some years he helped companies protect their employee against uh, what he calls a uh, human firewall that if you don't educate people on how to prevent you know someone to come into your organization all the technologies will not be practical so with that said um, i want to take a moment and have each one of you uh, for maybe two to four minutes, describe what you do and starting with now. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Cam. Uh, great to be here and be a part of such a esteemed group of people. Um, you know, familiar faces and new faces. And I think that's, that's the beauty of us as well. Um, so I run a company called the Digital Economist and we are a global impact ecosystem focused on building product services, uh, platforms and, and programs towards a human-centered digital economy. And that's really our mission. Uh, and to your point, um, uh, Cam, uh, building a, a company to help others start companies. So that's uh, that's the interesting twist here. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been privileged to work uh, in, in the blockchain space, which, you know, a critical component of that is the security angle, is cryptography. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, a, a lot of the use cases we're looking at are, are focused on cybersecurity, as you speak, in, uh, in the Center of Excellence um, uh, that I run on human-centered digital economy as well. And, um, and, and you know, I just as, uh, as I was reading through emails yesterday, uh, I saw the news on, you know, Bitcoin, ransomware, uh, 2.5 million recovered, uh, and then I thought this is perfect. Uh, you know, and, and just two hours later, here we are talking about, you know, all of those things at the same time. But I'll stop there and, and I'll jump in after the others uh, introduce themselves. Thank you. Alfredo. Thank you very much. And also, it's a big honor to be here sharing uh, this time with the panelists. And thank you for the invitation as well. So I'm a principal research scientist at Red Sun Production Systems. We are a firm that we help organizations function better and increase, and increase their productivity at the same time that we increase the health of the organization by taking into account natural human behaviors, com social complexity, and, and all of the things, all the ingredients that say that can make a group of people achieve outstanding performance or the opposite, they weaken the organization. So I'm, a, I'm also visiting scholar at the MIT Media Lab, and my research work over the last years has been to analyze data generated by users as they interact with social media, they interact with one another, they post pictures and so on, but they leave traces of their activity, and if you gather all of that and you observe the thing as a whole, you can observe the social system and learn a lot of properties about it, whether at national or city large scale, so they're down to organizations. So it's pretty much bridging system science with data analysis um, to bring mental maps closer to the territory and to make more effective decisions. Oliver? I just hope the rain is not too strong in the background, but it should be fine. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for thinking of Switzerland. Um, my name is Oliver Muncho. I work in the area of penetration testing since 1998. And one of the companies I started was in 2015, which I represent today here, is Lucy Security, where we focus on education of employees. We developed a software which mainly was focused for the Swiss banking sector in the beginning 
to train employees with a solution on site. And um, we gave uh, companies or organizations like a tool to train employees towards like certain cybersecurity risks because we saw like from pen tests, but also from like the use cases that very often uh, the target were the employees. And additionally, we enabled like companies to do real uh, attack simulations. So we gave them also tool sets to start torching, <laughs> attacking the employees with all the kind of attacks that are out there, starting from real ransomware simulation, Java-based attacks, like kind of like everything you can imagine, you could throw it at the employees and see how they react. So that's a little bit like what we do as a company. Thank you. Okay. Yes, uh, and I'd like to echo everybody else's comments. Uh, it's great and an honor to be here to, on this panel. Um, as uh, was mentioned, uh, I, I'm a chief cybersecurity officer at Trend Micro, and, and what I do is work with many different groups within uh, Trend Micro. Trend Micro, if you're not familiar with it, is a cybersecurity solutions provider, been around for 30 plus years. Um, it's it's a, essentially a 30 year old startup. <laughs> uh, the culture uh, that we have at Trend Micro is really focused on innovation and and really focusing on the people, but also on the, the technology side of the house. So what we provide is security solutions for endpoint, uh, network, cloud, and email and web gateways. And so over the years, our sort of mission has evolved uh, in that area and going from a traditional antivirus uh, company into this uh, complete holistic uh, solutions provider. So what I, what's near and dear to my heart at Trend Micro is that we do an abundance of threat and vulnerability research associated with um, ongoing attacks. Um, and yeah, I think uh, likewise, that was, as was mentioned, I was very happy to see that there was a recovery of 2.3 or 2.5 million in Bitcoin in the recent colonial attack um, because <laughs> uh, I realized that federal law enforcement and government actually, you know, scored a win on this one and getting that money back. But um, so what's interesting about my background and what I do at Trend has been this intersection of my past life and current life when it comes to areas of interest, uh, other areas of interest, not only a threat and vulnerability research at the house, but a, a lot of work that we do on smart factories, um, also smart cities work, um, on this whole notion of converged IT and OT risk. So that's pretty much where I sit and some of the background that I have. Great. One of the things that I wanted to also mention is uh, whenever you look at the security, there is a not like one company can do everything. So it's almost like a marketplace where you go and you say, okay, I need some of this or I need some of that. And when I put together the whole thing, then that is the pure uh, security platform. So it's a lots of partnership. And this was a conversation that I actually had with each one of you that I've, you know, been delighted to be in chairing this panel because talking to each one of you, I find opportunity to work within this, you know, organization that we are putting together, which is, I call it triangle of trust. And, you know, what Ed does, what, you know, Navrup does, what Oliver does, and what Alfredo does all feeds into it. Uh, with that said, um, previously I was speaking at the Veracis in regards to a topic of our own startup, which is decentralized company, we call it Deco, which has a lot of similarity to what Navrup is doing. Is because if you want to bring people and help them become entrepreneur, if you don't provide a platform to enable them, they're going to fail. So what we do with Pico is to help them be successful on what they do through bringing lots of partners and managing the work. With that said, I'd like to have Navrup take a moment and define why security is important for long-lasting partnership relationship between individuals and companies. Yeah, I think we're... Thank you, Cam. We're referring to security in a, in a, in a fairly broad way, um, you know, not just of organizations, uh, data from an individual sort of perspective, uh, but also at an organizational level um, uh, to what I'm hearing in, in the panel so far. 
um, right? And I think the mechanisms uh, would vary depending on sort of what is there to protect, um, right? And and what what is the how of it? Um, you know, to to your question about the the role of security, kind of when you're looking at sort of a longer term perspective, you know, again, the, there's a whole bunch of and to your point, the platform play uh, that comes in that that has to be protected. So, for example, when I onboard, uh, you know, folks in the organization um, and right before we did our DevOps launch and I said, well, you know, you got to get phishing attacks and here is a two hour workshop that I put together with zero background <laughs> in cybersecurity to make sure that, uh, you know, everybody has at least the very minimum sort of uh, uh, level of um, you know uh, security, and we don't make the obvious mistakes. Um, uh, you know, as as again, sort of um, you know, you go go out in the world. So that's one thing. The other is about data, right? Um, do we have best practices in place as organizations um, and and partner in order to protect that data? Because all of us are leaving traces of this data with every platform we interact with. And those platforms don't talk to each other. And that's a problem, right? Because the way the internet developed, uh, starting from sort of the original version, I had the privilege to meet actually T. Berners-Lee um, um, at, uh, at World Economic Forum a couple of years ago uh, to where it is now, where we plug into the World Wide Web through these handful of platforms, right? Google, Facebook, and, and you name it. So, all of that data sits in those gateway platforms uh, and, and, you know, they have access to this. And then the question is how secure are these uh, companies? So we're starting to see movements. Uh, Facebook installed something called its own Supreme Court uh, a few months ago, it's sort of, you know, from, from there advised by that, uh, uh, you know, Facebook, uh, is continuing to suspend uh, the previous president's uh, Facebook account for another couple of years. So we're starting to see these sort of self-regulatory movements as corporations are becoming even more powerful than governments. And that conversation is is happening everywhere, you know, whether it is uh, forums like VEF, um, focused companies uh, that are in business for that, or just the whole cybersecurity as a domain. Uh, I wrote one of the first papers, um, which I never published, but you know, I wrote the paper on uh, <laughs> crowdfunding meets blockchain and sort of like, what are the challenges that we are seeing? This was in 2016 or five years ago. Um, and one of the big ones uh, and the reason for the, you know, one of the reasons for so much interest in the decentralized space, which Cam, I'm sure you can speak a lot more to, is is security the cost of uh, securing systems is just continuing to rise and so many billions are lost every year that it's not even news anymore unless something kind of high profile happens um and and i'm sure the other panelists have have a lot more to add here uh but you know again at, at a, from a non-technical perspective the importance of sharing that data. And, and again, I'm, I'm sure Alfredo can speak more to that uh, with, with the Trust Data Alliance at MIT, um, uh, informing these data consortiums, which I think is a very cool idea um, to uh, uh, to actually share data in a, in a safe way um, can, can go a long way. So there are solutions, you know, folks are working on. I think the hardest thing is to really get people together to talk and build that baseline trust uh, from where to start with. And again, technology can play a role, but that's not the only thing. I mean, six years in, in it, I think uh, there's more to it than just blockchain, for example. True, uh, blockchain actually can create a container, but you still need a lot of complex system to make association of who does what and the behavior of it. With that said, I think Alfredo's um, work has been focused around defining the behavior of individual parts in a complex system. So with that said, um, mm -hmm. Alfredo, how do you think your research can help organization become more decentralized? Because of you know this you know, pandemic, uh, companies mm -hmm. have been forced to go away from the centralized model to decentralized model. And through that decentralization introduced lots of security holes. So it, uh, with that said, I'm kind of uh, 
give us some background on how a complex system can help um, building a more secure organization. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the, the introduction on the past. And, you know, I think it's important to put things before in a big context, right? In the larger context. So we live in a hyper-connected world. Everyone has access to everyone at any time, anywhere in the world. And let's say that the degrees of freedom, so the possibilities uh, of events have not only multiplied, have exploded, but have grown explosively over the last years because you have increasing number of parts and just unlimited number of associations. And it's precisely the associations of the different people and the different components what can create the different events. Uh, whether they are major events like the corona or like bitcoins or crashes and so on. And there's always a thing in complex systems that we say, is it the match that caused the fire or is it the fact that the grass is absolutely dry and ready to burn, right? And that's the relationship that exists between structure and behaviors and behaviors generally arise. They are construct the structure behind the system and the structure underlying the system already sets the, the space for the emergence of certain types of behaviors. And there we have, for instance, a security breaches. And then we have, there we have like, well, models that are more fragile to other models in terms of uh, how exposed they are. To, to events and, and, and for failure, including security as part of extreme events and things that are unexpected, but that may happen. So what are the principles that we follow? First, precaution. So ma major precaution, and it's, it's something that needs to be taken really seriously because uh, one of these attacks is a typical thing that it doesn't happen until it happens. So you definitely want to be prepared um, the interests around the current world also are not just about your activity. You are part of a larger context, and there is, a, let's say, conflict of interest in the larger scale. So you are part of a interest of certain groups. And the more people think internalize this and bring their mental model closer to, to the reality, they're going to understand then the responsibility that they have first by create, having a platform that creates data from people, even if it's your employees at your own company, that's personal data. And who owns that data? Where is that data located? How is that data used for uh, good purposes? Is something that it's not a, it's not a clear answer. And definitely, there's like initiatives like the Trust Initiative at MIT and so on that want to create this ecosystem. But in the background, we have as well the decentralization of organizations, which is something that it's happening inevitably. So regardless of uh, whether cybersecurity is becoming worse or not, Se organizations tend to decentralize as uh, the world also becomes more complex because if, if you are overwhelmed by complexity, you need to decentralize, divide work, and divide and win. And in the way you decentralize really is the key for you to become stronger as an organization, not only in terms of performance, but also in terms of security. And every kind of issue that requires collective action, distributed collective action. So people, the ones that are on the floor, the ones that are operating the machines, the ones that, that are uh, using the technology, they are the ones that are exposed most of the time to what uh, is actually uh, happening in the company or not. And you want to have their decisions to be aligned and coherent with the collective purpose. And there is where how to decentralize a organization comes into play. And the key really is to um, have, let's say, the two layers, a direction layer, a leadership layer that gathers uh, people, especially in terms of their vision and what the collective is supposed to be doing and not supposed to be doing, um, such that they can gain this information and can evaluate, let's say, the varieties and the behaviors on their own and make autonomous decisions. But it needs to be consistent. It needs to be um, a structure. Um, so, it, so you can find that balance between we're all doing things autonomously and we're all doing the same thing, as opposed to you're all following my orders and I'm centralizing the control, which is then the path to create major fragility um, in a corporation. So what you're saying is almost like a mathematical model of defining the behavior of, of a subcomponent where each one of them knows autonomously how to operate. And then yeah. when you have all that organization roll up, then you have one uh, secure um, 
and continuous operation. Yeah, and, and, and the key that... Telling the other one what to do. Each one knows what right. to do with their own. And with the flavor that security is an emergent solution. It's, a, it's something that it's constructed co collectively. There is no one magic software that will solve it because otherwise it wouldn't be security, you know, because you attack that one single software and then you're in. So the fact that the system behind is increasing entropy in, in technical terms, which is increasing all the ways in which it can try to, to get at you, it means that on the other side, you need to have like, multiply your filters capturing this amount of information. And guess what? You have a bunch of extremely smart people in your organization, despite the fact that you ask them to do one single thing, they can do a thousand more. So it's about bringing motivation and bringing the best out of people. Got it. It's almost, uh, I want to go to yes. Ed, uh, because he worked for the Secret Service for some 20 years, and the role of the Secret Service is to help not only the president, but also the entire organization of government. Uh, so it's very important to actually maintain this type of checks and balances within this complex system, which, you know, as we can see it, the most complex system is U.S. government. Uh, with that said, one thing that Oliver does, which is very unique, is the human behavior. You could have a mathematical modeling of the complex system, but if the people that are part of organization do not follow best practices that is recommended, then the system will fall apart. So um, one thing that Oliver did for me is because he has two companies that they work together and one of the company actually goes into the dark web and searches on the marketplace on the things that are for sale. So he did a search for me and my name came up with, you know, login and password for one of the systems that I've used in the past. I'm not using them for now, but it was interesting that there are lots of information on the digital space that you really need to uh, worry about. And with that said, Oliver, tell us a little bit about what you do at Lucy and uh, how you help organization protect themselves. <clears throat> yeah, well, we, um, we try to solve the, the big challenge of uh, securing the data in the company. And we sometimes see like it really starts from the beginning to understand even what the critical assets are and just have some scenarios worked out. So it's, it's a very complex, uh, complex situation we're in. And um, I see the struggle since we started with IT security in over 20 years, where focus was very much uh, on technology. I mean, you, it's always like new words, new expressions, IDS, IDS, endpoint protection, sandbox filtering. I don't know. You know, it just goes on. But what, what you also see is that the number of breaches doesn't go down. The number of incidents doesn't go down. So the security doesn't really improve over time. And the concepts and the approaches may, might change. And our company focuses very much on the uh, user behavior, even though you can't actually segregate that from the technology. Uh, just to make you an example, like I see some companies train their users not to click on links. I tell them, well, why you train them to do this? If this, if this is the entry point for a hacker to your organization, you can basically just give up. I mean, like if 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 your security is based on a user not clicking on a link, that's that's tough to solve. So we we try to focus on the more dangerous scenarios. But even there, it's like it's always the question: What can you solve technically? And what responsibility do you give to user? So we try to solve this by educating the user and doing attack simulations. And you can improve it uh, to a certain point to get rid of like the background noise of the attacks, like those unstructured attacks. So you might get lucky and have less of those attacks. But to be honest, like, if, uh, like a more sophisticated attacker uh, wants to get hold of data in a company, there's little to nothing what our company can do or any technical precaution can do. And that's that's like what I observed since more than 20 years, coming also from the penetration testing, knowing how like in financial sector and governmental sector, how all those products work together and how they don't work. So um, there's, there's a certain limitation and a certain insecurity. And I, my conclusion is like, it's just among many other insecurities we live in in our worlds, like, we might get hit by asteroids. This is an insecurity. And cyber insecurity is probably just one among of them. And the only reason why we didn't have like a, I don't know, a cybersecurity Pearl Harbor so far 
my conclusion is that there must be other reasons because it's probably not that there's not the technology or the know-how to conduct those attacks. So there, I mean, this is more philosophical uh, uh, discussion, but I just see like there's the possibilities are, I mean, I mean, gigantic. If like a really professional security company would switch on the bad side, I mean, what they could do is like uh, really crazy. So uh, we try to help probably against the more unstructured stuff, the hackers, which are not so good. Um, um, and that's what we focus on. But what is interesting, you also create a simulated attack, as you mentioned yesterday, that uh, you, know, you create a model that you say, okay, I'm gonna help the organization by approaching the employee to see if they fall for it. And it's, yeah. it's much better if they fall for a simulated uh, integration test than the real one. So that, that that can go horribly wrong if the own company starts attacking the employee. Like that can be misinterpreted, of course. But I mean, there are two ways. There are two ways how you can uh, you, how you can find out. You just wait until you're hacked, until you find your data in the darknet. That's why we provide this service with a different uh, company. Um, just hope for the best. Just do what the, the other ones do. Or you could also start going the role of attacking the employees and just selling that in the way like here is a safe learning environment where you can experience how it feels. And then you can find out how they really react. Do they download something in the browser? Do they activate like a signed Java applet? Do they open something in a PDF and so on? So they are like a bad USB. And, and I mean, there's so many technologies. You don't even know where to start really. And then um, you can find out like, yeah, how do they really react to this? And then you get a better understanding if you're able to close that gap, that's that's a different that's a different uh, uh, challenge. But at least you you get to an understanding of like, okay, if someone really would attack us, that's where we are, and, and that's probably how you put need to put that in context. Like, get a good understanding of the risk, do the best you can, and probably accept the remaining risk. Thank you. And this kind of brings us to the concept of traceability. So whenever you are in a complex system, you want to know where the data came in. This relates to both uh, Navru and Alfredo's work, but in the work of government, you always want to know what is your status? What is your background? And this is the work that uh, Ed did when he was at the Secret Service that, you know, you, you try to always gather the intelligence to know who is invited to an event prior to them <laughs> arriving. So almost you have a staging places. It's not about, you know, you have this badge and you can come to the event. Who are you? All that traceability is very important. And with that said, you know, when I was having conversation with Ed, uh, it seems like we need another, uh, almost like a machine learning or AI driven system that allocates security and watches the behavior because just because you know in case of presidential event i've been in a few of them it's not about that you have the badge you can get in what you do at the event is also very important so you're being monitored even when you are in the system so this continuous monitoring is very important and i believe um, ed's company trend micro has a platform to achieve that so ed do you want to kind of allow yeah that? no I Absolutely. I like the way you sort of uh, bridged, you know, the, the physical and the cyber. A uh, couple of themes I really wanted to pick up on that everybody's really been speaking to. One you mentioned in the very beginning is trust and the issue of trust. We talked uh, about um, trust associated with, um, you know, uh, uh, cryptocurrencies and so forth. How from a technology perspective, you're sort of enabling this trust through distributed manners and so forth. The one thing that really ties in around this trust concept is uh, the cyber criminal uh, groups and networks. They haven't uh, evolved in a vacuum, right? They have been evolved in many parts of the world, but the Russian speaking uh, area, uh, cyber criminal underground has really been that sort of that forefront of innovation, if you would say, around cybercrime. And so they've been evolving since the mid 1990s. And what we see today is the problems that we have. And, and it's all due to 
uh, the same thing that we enjoy from an automation perspective. Uh, we enjoy uh, our digital transformation to cloud, to mobile, uh, the being able to have real time, um, uh, on time or just in time manufacturing and you name it. So this is something that has been growing for quite some time. And as we've been sort of reaping the benefits at the legitimate and consumer and business level, these cyber criminals have created a, an ecosystem that parallels that and then been taken advantage of the same automation uh, as well. And so they've been able to reach out uh, and touch organizations uh, for quite some time. And so trust is something that they've been able to do in the cyber criminal undergrounds that really is akin to tech startups, right? We talk about how uh, startups is pretty much the engine of innovation for everything that we do from, uh, from a technology perspective, but every sector across the board. And the one thing that is sort of true around most technical startups is the fact that it's a meritocracy, right? You come together, individuals with certain basic uh, skill sets, and you're able to come together and create something really unique and really awesome. Well, <laughs> the flip side of that coin is in the cyber criminal underground, you have individuals with certain skill sets that have evolved and have come together and created something, some very nefarious um, <laughs> um, attacks uh, that we're dealing with today. And so a lot of the stuff that we talk about is, is, is really rooted in this trust. They're able to scale trust beyond what we can do. Uh, we struggle between law enforcement, security, security industry, and different stakeholders within our organization to build the trust even within our own organization, uh, much less to external stakeholders. They are, are able to uh, trust individuals that they have no idea what their real name is. Uh, the, the pseudonyms and, and the actual uh, cyber cred instead of a, you know, a street cred, uh, cred, cyber cred that they've built around their personas is what elevates them into these different groups. And so they're able to quite, quite quickly come together in these almost criminal incubators and be able to create some, 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 some really bad, you know, attacks. And so that's that's the the problem that we have right now is that a lot of these organizations or these technical or these like i said these criminal um organizations um they've been operating for quite some time in this um i always talk about uh, they have uh this free reign so to speak because they operate in some countries where there's no extradition treaties there's no ability to grab those individuals or it's a delayed gratification problem where we have to be able to indict somebody but not able to arrest them until many years later until they travel to a a country that has uh, an extradition treaty so a lot of this is is really rooted in this um problem that we have and we we haven't done a really good job strategically. Like I mentioned earlier, I think that the win is really important about us seizing those uh, Bitcoins that were paid in ransom because that has really changed the landscape that we're at. Digital extortion, ransomware attacks has changed the landscape. And, and so before it's, you know, stealing data, parsing data, reselling that data or stealing credit card information, bank information, parsing it and reselling it in the criminal undergrounds. Now with digital extortions, uh, certain sectors that have been immune to cyber crime, uh, uh, cyber criminal attacks, such as critical, critical infrastructure, such as pipeline providers, such as uh, water treatment plants, uh, municipalities, a lot of locations that have not really needed, nobody's really, there was no monetization you know, um, in those types of attacks to go after those types of organizations. Now, digital extortion has opened it up. Uh, and now it's not necessarily, can you protect your data? Like what we talked about today, where's your data? How can you protect it? And, and data is truly the, the epicenter of everything that we do digitally. But, but now it's, can you have access to that data? Can you, is, is the integrity of that data? It's not just somebody stealing it and, and reselling it. Now it's a whole new ball game. Now it's operational risk, which 
uh, a lot of organizations struggle. I mean, I mean, that's why we, at Trend Micro, we pivoted, pivoted into this notion of, uh, this much more holistic approach. Just like you, you mentioned, Cam, that it's, and even Oliver mentioned that you can't just have one tool or, um, you know, it's not just one solution. Um, it's now it's, you need to be able to mitigate risk across everything that you do digitally. And so until you have visibility across everything that you do and be able to orchestrate your defenses in such a manner that is the sort of bringing it all the way back to the physical side that you mentioned, uh, protecting uh, uh, a particular building or, or an individual, a president of the United States, you name it. You cannot just protect one element or one, you know, area of concern and let the others, you know, you know, be wide open. So it has to be this, this complete, you know, solution idea and concept to reduce risk. And, you know, we don't sell all the tools that possibly an organization would need regarding, regardless of every sector, but it's that how do we work together with other organ, uh, other companies? Um, Cam, we talked about, I think it was around identity access management and how certain organizations partner with other providers. That's the only way to do it. One, it's the right way to do it, but I mean, for us to be effective as security solution providers, we need to be able to sit in a security stack of technology to be able to interoperate with everything. Um, and all the products that we're talking here, from a training and awareness to data protection to you name it, um, and from an operational technology side of the house, but also a IT side of the house. So I probably said a lot, <laughs> but I think, I think I, I, I just really wanted to bring it all together. Everything we've been saying is that the reason why we do what we do is, is because, you know, the cyber risk is really, you know, lies at the intersection of people, process, and technology. So if we're not talking the complete picture or why we are doing or why we need to do things, then, you know, why do the things, you know, why do we exist for that matter? So I think that is the one thing I really wanted to sort of tie it together. So then the need of the platform is, is essential, is not nice to have, is because it's almost like a nature. Nature is very uh, decentralized, is very diversified. So you need to actually let everyone to come into the ecosystem because everybody has something to offer. Uh, and if you don't really provide a safe platform, then those that come in, like early adapter, they want to share, but they get, uh, you know, they get disappointed from the, the hacks that happens. And that kind of brings the next step on creating that ecosystem, which is holistic, nature-based, and is trusted, which is the work that, you know, Navrup and Alfredo are doing. So Navrup, in order to create such an ecosystem, trust and security is essential. But now you need to have the economic value that maybe the work that Alfredo does on his research, where he says on a complex system, everybody needs to contribute. So it's like, you know, as you build this complex system, you need to have a model that, you know, it becomes valuable for people to contribute to this ecosystem and take something back. So with that said, uh, how do you see this decentralized way of life becomes permanent, not just for pandemic and then go back to the centralized model? Yeah, that's an interesting question, Cam. Um, I think um, Ed really kind of summarized it when it comes to people, processes, and and technology. Right, there's a component of of each one of them. Um, we used to be more secure than we are now when it comes to digital tech, right? Because systems were not so centralized because it weren't just a handful of big platforms. Um, that could be attacked and, 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 and you know, uh, these uh, relatively single points of failure, right, than in the past. So it's not a uh, natural state of being. It's a certain way that technology evolved due to efficiency gains. Um, and, you know, this is not to say throw everything out, uh, but, uh, 
you know, building in these heuristics, which again, I think Alfredo and uh, Oliver and, and practice can and speak to a lot more. That is, that is key when you're, you know, building systems. Um, and, and, you know, it's funny because as, as Ed was talking, I'm kind of taking a little bit of a philosophical sort of thing um, here is like something has to be said about the intent of, of folks as well, right? It, it's simply not economic too, uh, you know. Uh, there is a huge component of that, but um, I think there's the, the, the legal side of things. I mean, the U.S. government, which, I mean, we, <laughs> we live in the U.S., but there's a lot to be said about its own practices, uh, you know, not only overseas, but also towards if not against its own citizens and it's shocking when you learn things right uh, about about sort of government practices and I wonder uh, a lot of the inspiration <laughs> to the rest of the world perhaps in turn comes from the U.S. government uh, at some point you know from the 70s or the 80s or, or what have you and um, Oliver you talked about uh, the Pearl Harbor hasn't happened yet and I think it's it's it happens all the time you know it's it's become so commonplace that uh, you know it's uh, at least from a you know hopefully nobody gets hold of nuclear codes here since we're talking real security but uh, but it is already sort of very concerning not only just the erosion of uh, economic value but also the human cost of it right um, and and that's kind of what I was hearing about this ransomware attack as well it's not just these big companies pipeline companies it's really like disruptive for people and and that could be easily scaled um, as well so you know I don't know if we could just be pessimistic and say oh well the best that's just do the best we can or there's more that could be done um, you know, the word sort of that continuing in my ears was around education, right? Uh, the fact that there's so much value in certain platforms that there is uh, uh, an incentive for an outsider to attack those systems and think that's the level where it should be kind of understood at, um, right? And so uh, a different arrangement of uh and a different sort of like uh, levers and incentives could change that ecosystem. I don't know what all it's going to take, but, you know, I'd, I'd love to kind of brainstorm about, you know, what, what I guess that world will look like. So I'll pause here because I know yeah. the panelists. We are almost at the end of the panel. Um, just I wanted to bring it into closing um, the conversation that, you know, we had all together uh, Ed, Nauru, Oliver, and Alfredo, that security is essential for the organization and society to you know, properly function and thrive. And because of the changes that we had in uh, recent past years because of pandemic and everything become decentralized and hybrid, now we're going to have new uh, new holes in our infrastructure in our organization that people could tap into and the best way to uh, deal with it is to also become decentralized so that means you deal with this decentralized model in a very decentralized fashion bring work that Alfredo has done on defining complex system the work that Ed has done with Trend Micro on creating a platform the work that Oliver does with the human-driven uh, awareness, and then bringing it all together with you know the work that Nagroup does on defining a digital economist of how people can operate and have meaningful jobs and businesses in a very secure way, very similar to how you have it in the family, how you have it in the nature. So that's it. Thank you all for joining and. Hope to see you guys in person soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.